The following is a free-for-download audiobook available on krishnapath.org. Easy Journey to Other Planets Chapter 1 Anti-Material Worlds Materialistic science may one day finally discover the eternal anti-material world, which has for so long been unknown to the wranglers of gross materialism. Regarding the scientists' present conception of antimatter, the Times of India, October 27, 1959, published the following news release. Stockholm, October 26, 1959. Two American atomic scientists were awarded the 1959 Nobel Physics Prize today for the discovery of the antiproton, proving that matter exists in two forms as particles and antiparticles. They are Italian-born Emilio Sergei, 69, and Dr. Owen Chamberlain, born in San Francisco. According to one of the fundamental assumptions of the new theory, there may exist another world, or an anti-world, built up of antimatter. This anti-material world would consist of atomic and subatomic particles spinning in reverse orbits of those of the world we know now. Of these two worlds, if these two worlds should ever clash, they would both be annihilated in one blinding flash. In this statement, the following propositions are put forward. Number one, there is an antimaterial atom or particle which is made up of the qual anti qualities of material atoms. Number two, there is another world besides this material world of which we only have a limited experience. And number three, the anti-material and material worlds may clash at a certain period and may annihilate one another. Out of these three items, we, the students of theistic science, can fully agree with items one and two, but we can agree with item three only within the limited scientific definition of antimatter. The difficulty lies in the fact that the scientist's conception of antimatter extends only to another variety of material energy, whereas the real antimatter must be entirely antimaterial. Matter, as it is constituted, is subject to annihilation, but antimatter, if it is to be free from all material symptoms, must also be free from annihilation by its very nature. If matter is destructible or separable, antimatter must be indestructible and inseparable. We shall try to discuss these propositions from the angle of authentic scriptural vision. The most widely recognized scriptures of the, in the world are the Vedas. The Vedas have been divided into four parts, Sama, Jagar, Rig, and Atarva. The subject matter of the Vedas is very difficult for a man of ordinary understanding. For elucidation, the four Vedas are explained in the historical epic called the Mahabharata and in the 18 Puranas. The Ramayana is also a historical epic which contains all the necessary information from the Vedas. So, the four Vedas, the original Ramayana by Valmiki, the Mahabharata, and the Puranas are classified as Vedic literatures. The Upanishads are parts of the four Vedas and the Vedanta Sutras represent the cream of the Vedas. To summarize all these Vedic literatures, the Bhagavad Gita is accepted as the essence of all Upanishads and the preliminary explanation of the Vedanta Sutras. One may then conclude that from the Bhagavad Gita alone, one can have the essence of the Vedas, for it is spoken by Lord Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who descends upon this material world from the anti-material world in order to give complete information of the superior form of energy. The superior form of energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is described in the Bhagavad Gita as Paraprakriti. The scientists have recently discovered that there are two forms of perishable matter, but the Bhagavad Gita describes most perfectly the concept of matter and antimatter in terms of two forms of energy. Matter is an energy which creates the material world, and the same energy in its superior form also creates the anti-material, transcendental world. The living entities belong to the category of superior energy. 
The inferior energy or material energy is called apara-prakriti. In the Bhagavad Gita, the creative energy is thus presented in two forms, namely apara and para-prakriti. Matter itself has no creative power. When it is manipulated by the living entity, material things are produced. Matter in its crude form is therefore the latent energy of the Supreme Being. Whenever we think of energy, it is natural that we think of the source of energy. For example, when we think of electrical energy, we simultaneously think of the powerhouse where it is generated. Energy is not self-sufficient. It is under the control of a superior living being. For example, fire is the source of two other energies, namely heat and light. Light and heat have no independent existence outside of fire. Similarly, the inferior and superior energies are divided from a, are derived from a source, which one may be called by any name. That source of energy must be a living being with a full sense of everything. That supreme living being is the personality of Godhead, Shri Krishna, or the all-attractive living being. In the Vedas, the Supreme Living Being, or the Absolute Truth, is called Bhagavan, the Opulent One, the Living Being who is the fountainhead of all energies. The discovery of the two forms of limited energies by the modern scientists is just the beginning of the progress of science. Now they must go further to discover the source of the two particles or atoms which they term material and antimaterial. How can the antimaterial particle be explained? We have experience with material atoms or particles, but we have no experience with anti-material atoms. However, the Bhagavad Gita gives the following vivid description of the anti-material particle. This anti-material particle is within the material body. Because of the presence of this anti-material particle, the material body is progressively changing from boyhood to from childhood to boyhood from boyhood to youth to old age, after which the mater anti-material body leaves the old unworkable body and takes up another material body. This description of a living body confirms the scientific discovery that energy exists in two forms. When one of them, the anti-material particle, is separated from the material body, the latter becomes useless for all purposes. As such, the anti-material particle is undoubtedly superior to the material energy. No one, therefore, should lament for the loss of material energy. All varieties of sense perception in the categories of heat and cold, happiness and distress, are but interactions of material energy which come and go like seasonal changes. The temporary appearance and disappearance of such material interactions confirms that the material body is formed of a material energy inferior to the living force or jiva energy. Any intelligent man who is not disturbed by happiness and distress, understanding that there are different material phases resulting from the interactions of the inferior energy, is competent to regain the anti-material world where life is eternal, full of permanent knowledge and bliss. The anti-material world is mentioned here, and in addition, information is given that in the anti-material world, there is no, quote, seasonal, and quote, fluctuation. Everything there is permanent, blissful, and full of knowledge. But when we speak of it as a, a quote, world, end quote, we must remember that it has forms and paraphernalia of various categories beyond our material experiences. The material body is indestructible, and as such, it is changeable and temporary. So is the material world. But the anti-material living force is non-destructible, and therefore it is permanent. Expert scientists have thus distinguished the different qualities of the material and anti-material particles as temporary and permanent, respectively. The discoverers of the two forms of matter have yet to find out the qualities of antimatter. But, a vivid description is already given in the Bhagavad Gita as follows. The scientists can make further research on the basis of this valuable information. The anti-material particle is finer than the finest of material particles. This living force is so powerful that it spreads its influence all over the material body. The anti-material particle has immense potency in comparison to the material particle and consequently it cannot be destroyed. 
This is but the beginning of the description of the antimaterial particle in the Bhagavad Gita. It is further explained as follows. The finest form of the antimaterial particle is encaged within the gross and subtle material bodies. Although the material bodies, both gross and subtle, are subject to destruction, the finer antimaterial particle is eternal. One's interest, therefore, should be in this eternal principle. The perfection of science will occur when it is possible for the immaterial scientists to know the qualities of the antimaterial particle and liberate it from the association of non-permanent material particles. Such liberation would mark the culmination of scientific progress. There is partial truth in the scientist's suggestion that there may exist also another world consisting of antimaterial atoms and that a clash between the material and antimaterial worlds will result in the annihilation of both. There is a clash which is constantly going on. The annihilation of the material particles is taking place at every moment, and the non-material particle is striving for liberation. This is explained in the Bhagavad Gita as follows. The non-material particle, which is the living entity, influences the material particle to work. This living entity is always indestructible. As long as the non-material particle is within the lump of material energy, known by the names of gross and subtle bodies, then the entity will, is manifest as a living unit. In the continuous clashing between the two particles, the non-material particle is never annihilated. No one can destroy the anti-material particle at any time, past, present, or future. Therefore, we think that the theory maintaining that the material and anti-material worlds may clash, re resulting in the annihilation of both worlds, is correct only within the context of the scientist's limited definition of antimatter. The Bhagavad Gita explains the nature of the antimaterial particle, which can never be annihilated. The fine and immeasurable antimaterial particle is always indestructible, permanent, and eternal. After a certain period, however, its engagement by material particles is annihilated. This same principle also operates in the case of the material and antimaterial worlds. No one should fear the annihilation of the antimaterial particle, for it survives the annihilation of material worlds. Everything that is created is annihilated at a certain stage. Both the material body and the material world are created, and therefore they are subject to annihilation. The antimaterial particle, however, is never created and consequently it is never annihilated. This also is corroborated in the Bhagavad Gita. The anti-material particle, which is the vital force, is never born or created. It exists eternally. It has neither birth dates nor death dates. It is neither repeatedly created nor repeatedly destroyed. It is eternally existing and therefore it is the oldest of the old, and yet it is always fresh and new. Although the material particle is annihilated, the antimaterial particle is never affected. The principle is also applicable to the antimaterial universe as well as to the antimaterial particle. When the material universe is annihilated, the antimaterial universe exists in all circumstances. This will be explained in more detail later. The scientist may also learn the following from the Bhagavad Gita. The learned man who knows perfectly well that the antimaterial particle is indestructible knows that it cannot be annihilated by any means. The atomic scientists may consider annihilating the material world by nuclear weapons, but his weapons cannot destroy the antimaterial world. The antimaterial particle is more clearly explained in the following lines. It is neither cut to pieces by any material weapon, nor is it burnt by fire nor is it moistened by water, nor withered, nor dried up, nor evaporated in the air. It is indivisible, non-flammable, and insoluble. Because it is eternal, it can enter into and leave any sort of body. Being studied by constitution, its qualities are always fixed. It is inexplicable because it is contrary to all material qualities. It is unthinkable by the ordinary brain. It is unchangeable. No one, therefore, should lament for what is eternal anti-material principle. Thus, in the Bhagavad Gita and all other Vedic literatures, the superior energy anti-material particle is accepted as the vital force or the living spirit. This is also called the jiva. 
the living principle cannot be generated by any combination of material elements. There are eight material principles which are described as inferior energies, and they are 1. Earth, 2. Water, 3. Fire, 4. Air, 5. Ether, 6. Mind, 7. Intelligence, and 8. Ego. Apart from these is the living force, or the anti-material principle, which is described as the superior energy. These are called, quote, energies, end quote, because they are wielded and controlled by the supreme living being, the personality of Godhead, Krishna. For a long time, the materialist was limited within the boundary of the eight material principles mentioned above, now, it is encouraging to see that he has a little preliminary information of the anti-material principle and the anti-material universe. We hope that with the progress of time, the materialists will be able to estimate the value of the anti-material world in which there is no trace of material principles. Of course, the very word, quote, anti-material, end quote, indicates that the principle is in opposition to all material qualities. There are, of course, the mental speculators who comment upon the anti-material principles. They fall into two main groups, and they arrive at two different erroneous conclusions. One group, the gross materialists, either denies the anti-material principle or admits only the disintegration of material combination at a certain stage, death. The other group accepts the anti-material principle as being in direct opposition to the material principle with its 24 categories. This group is known as the Shankyites, and they investigate the material principles and analyze them minutely. At the end of their investigation, the Shankyites finally accept only the transcendental anti-material non-active principle. However, difficulties arise for all these mental speculators because they speculate with the help of the inferior energy. They do not accept information from the superior. In order to realize the real position of the anti-material principle, one must rise to the transcendental plane of superior energy. Bhakti yoga is the very activity of superior energy. From the platform of the material world, one cannot estimate the real position of at the anti-material world. But the Supreme Lord, who is the controller of both material and anti-material energies, descends out of his causeless mercy and gives us complete information of the anti-material world. In this way, we can know what the anti-material world is. The Supreme Lord and the living entities are both anti-material in quality, we are informed. Thus, we can have an idea of the Supreme Lord by an elaborate study of the living entities. Every living entity is an individual person. Therefore, the supreme living being must also be the supreme person. In the Vedic literatures, the supreme person is properly claimed to be Krishna. The name, quote, Krishna, end quote, indicating the supreme lord, is the only truly intelligible name of the highest order. He is the controller of both material and anti-material energies, and the very word, Krishna, signifies that he is the supreme controller. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord confirms this as follows. There are two worlds, the material and anti-material. The material world is composed of inferior qualitative energy divided into eight material principles. The anti-material world is made of superior qualitative energy. Because both the material and anti-material energies are emanations from the supreme transcendence, the personality of Godhead, it is proper to conclude that I, Lord Krishna, am the ultimate cause of all creations and annihilations. Because the Lord's two energies, inferior and superior, manifest the material and anti-material worlds, he is called the supreme absolute truth. Lord Sri Krishna explains this in Bhagavad Gita thus, quote, I am Arjuna, the highest principle of transcendence, and there is nothing greater than me. Everything that be rests on my energies, exactly like pearls on a thread. Long, long before the discovery of the principle of antimatter and the antimaterial worlds, the subject was delineated in the pages of Bhagavad Gita. The Gita itself indicates that its philosophy had previously been taught to the presiding deity of the sun, which implies that the principles of the Bhagavad Gita were expounded by the personality of Godhead long before the battle of Kurukshetra, 
at least some 120 million years before. Now, modern science has just discovered a fraction of the truths that are available in the Bhagavad Gita. The assumption of an anti-material universe is also found in the Bhagavad Gita, and from all data available, it is to be assumed without the slightest doubt that the anti-material world is situated in the anti-material sky, a sky which is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita as Sanatan Dharma, or the eternal nature. Exactly as material atoms create the material world, the anti-material atoms create the anti-material world with all its paraphernalia. The anti-material world is inhabited by anti-material living beings. In the anti-material world, there is no inert matter. Everything there is a living principle, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead in that region is God himself. The denizens of the anti-material world possess eternal life, eternal knowledge, and eternal bliss. In other words, they have all the qualifications of God. In the material world, the topmost planet is called Satyaloka, or Brahmaloka. Beings of the greatest talents live on this planet. The presiding deity of the Brahmaloka is Brahma, the first created being of this material world. Brahma is a living being like so many of us, but he is the most talented personality in the material world. He is not so talented that he is in the category of God, but he is in the category of those living entities directly dominated by God. God and the living entities both belong to the anti-material world. The scientists, therefore, should be rendering service to would be rendering service to everyone by researching the constitution of the anti-material world, how it is administered, how things are shaped there, who are the presiding personalities, and so on. Of the Vedic literature, Srimad Bhagavatam deals elaborately with these matters. The Bhagavad Gita is the preliminary study of the Srimad Bhagavatam. These two important books of knowledge should be thoroughly studied by all men in the scientific world. These books would give many clues to scientific progress and would indicate many new discoveries. The transcendentalists and the materialists are two distinct classes of men. The transcendentalists gathers knowledge from authoritative scriptures like the Vedas. Vedic literature is received from authoritative sources who are in the line of the transcendental disciplic succession. This disciplic succession, parampara, is also mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that hundreds of thousands of years ago, the Gita was spoken to the presiding deity of the sun, who delivered the knowledge to his son, Manu, from whom the present generation of man has descended. Manu, in his turn, delivered this transcendental knowledge to his son, King Ikshvaku, who is the forefather of the dynasty in which the personality of Godhead Shiram appeared. This long chain of disciplic succession was broken during the advent period of Lord Krishna 5,000 years ago, and for this reason Krishna restated the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, thereby making him the first disciple of this knowledge in this age. The transcendentalist of this age, therefore, is in the disciplic line that starts with Arjuna. Without troubling himself with materialistic research work, the transcendentalist acquires the truth concerning material matter and antimatter in the most perfect way, through this disciplic succession, and thereby saves himself much botheration. The gross materialists, however, do not believe in the antimaterial worlds of the personality of Godhead. They are therefore unfortunate creatures, although sometimes very talented, education, educated, and advanced otherwise. They are bewildered by the influence of the material manifestation and are devoid of knowledge of, the thing, of things anti-material. It is a good sign, therefore, that the materialistic scientists are gradually progressing toward the region of the anti-material world. It may even be possible for them to make sufficient progress to be able to know the details of this anti-material world, where the personality of Godhead resides as the predominating figure and where the living entities live with him and serve him. The living entities who serve the Godhead are equal in quality to him, but at the same time they are predominated as servitors. In the anti-material world, there is no difference between the predominated and the predominator. The relationship is in perfection and without tinge of materialism. The nature of the material world is destructive. According to this Bhagavad Gita, 
There is some partial truth to the assumption of the physical scientists that there is annihilation of the material and antimaterial worlds when they chance to clash. The material world is a creation of changing modes of nature. These modes, gunas, are known as sattva, goodness, rajas, passion, and tamas, ignorance. The material world is created by the mode of rajas, maintained by the mode of sattva, and annihilated by the mode of tamas. These modes are omnipresent in the material world, and as such, at every hour, every minute, every second, the process of creation, maintenance, and annihilation is taking place all over the material universe. The highest planet in the mater of the material universe, Brahmaloka, is also subjected to these modes of nature, although the duration of life on that planet, due to the predominance of this mode of sattva, is said to be four times three or four million three hundred thousand times one thousand times two times thirty times twelve times one hundred solar years. Despite this long duration, however, Brahmaloka is subject to destruction, although life on Brahmaloka is fantastically long compared to life on Earth, it is only a flash in comparison to the eternal life of the non-material worlds. Consequently, the speaker of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Sri Krishna, asserts the importance of the anti-material universe, which is his abode. Lord Krishna instructs that all the planets within this material universe are destroyed at the end of 4,300,000 times 1,000 times 2 times 30 times 12 times 100 solar years. And all the living beings inhabiting these material planets are destroyed materially along with the destruction of the material worlds. The living entity, however, is constitutionally an anti-material particle. But unless he elevates himself to the region of the anti-material worlds by cultivation of anti-material activities, he is destroyed materially at the annihilation of the material world and is subject to take rebirth in, the mater in, a, in a material shape with the rebirth of a new material universe. In other words, he is subject to the pains of repeated birth and death. Only those living entities who take to the loving service of the Personality of Godhead during the manifested stage of material life are undoubtedly transferred to the anti-material worlds after quitting the material body. Immortality is obtained only by those who return to Godhead by practice of anti-material activities. What are these anti-material activities? They are medicines. For example, when a man falls ill, he goes to a physician who prescribes medicines which eventually cure the suffering patient. Similarly, the materialist is ailing, and he should consult an expert transcendentalist physician. What is his ailment? He is suffering the tribulations of repeated births, deaths, diseases, and old age. Once he agrees to put himself under the, quote, back to Godhead, end quote, treatment, he is able to transfer himself to the anti-material world where there is eternal life instead of birth and death. Annihilation of the material world takes place in two ways. Partial annihilation occurs at the end of every 4,300,000 or 4, 300,000 times 1,000 solar years, or at the end of each day of Brahmaloka, which is the topmost planet of, in the material world. During that time of partial annihilation, the topmost planets such as Brahmaloka are not annihilated, but at the end of each duration of 4,300,000 times 1,000 times 2 times 30 times 12 times 100 solar years, the entire cosmic manifestation is merged into the anti-material body from whence the material principles emanate, manifest, and merge after annihilation. The anti-material world, which is far removed from the material sky, is never annihilated. It absorbs the material world. It may be that a, quote, clash, end quote, occurs between the material and anti-material worlds, as suggested by the scientists, and that the material worlds are destroyed, but there is no annihilation of the anti-material worlds. The eternally existing anti-material world is unmanifested to the material scientist. He can simply have information of it insofar as the principles of its existence are contrary to the modes of the material world. Full details of the anti-material universe can be known only from the ineffable or infallible source of liberated authorities who have thoroughly realized the constitution of the anti-material principle. 
This information is received by oral reception by a submissive disciple of the personality of Godhead. The Vedic knowledge was thus imparted in, unto the heart of Brahma, the first living being in the material creation. It was Brahma who related this knowledge to the sage Narada Muni. Similarly, the Bhagavad Gita was spoken by the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, to Vivashwan, the presiding deity of the sun. And when the oral chain of disciplic succession was broken, Lord Krishna repeated the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. At that time, Arjuna took the role of a disciple and student in order to receive transcendental knowledge from Sri Krishna. In order to drive out all misgivings which the gross materialists of the world may have, Arjuna asked all relevant questions and the answers were given by Krishna so that any layman can understand them. Only those who are captivated by the glamour of the material world cannot accept the authority of Lord Sri Krishna. One has to become thoroughly clean in habit and heart before one can understand the details of the anti-material world. Bhakti Yoga is a detailed scientific transcendental activity that both the neophyte and the perfect yogi can practice. The material world is only a shadow representation of the anti-material world, and intelligent men who are clean in heart and habit will be able to learn, in a nutshell, all the details of the anti-material world from the text of Bhagavad Gita, and these are in actuality more exhaustive than material details. The basic details are as follows. The presiding deity of the anti-material world is Sri Krishna, who exists in his original personality as well as in his many plenary expansions. This personality and his plenary expansions can be known only by anti-material activities commonly known as bhakti yoga or devotional service. The personality of Godhead is the supreme truth and he is the whole anti-material principle. The material principle as well as the anti-material principle is an emanation from his person. He is the root of the complete tree. When water is poured onto the root of the tr a tree, the tr branches and tr tr leaves are nourished automatically. And in the same way, when Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, is worshipped, all details of the material worlds are enlightened and the heart of the devotee is nourished without his having to work in a materialistic way. This is the secret of the Bhagavad Gita. The process of entering into the anti-material worlds differs from materialistic processes. The living, individual living beings can very easily enter the anti-material world by practicing anti-material activities while residing in the material world. But those who are truly gross materialists who depend on the limited strength of experimental thought, mental speculation, and materialistic scientist, science find great difficulty entering the anti-material worlds. The gross materialists may try to approach the anti-material worlds by endeavoring with spaceships, satellites, rockets, etc., which he throws into outer space, but by such means he cannot even approach the material planets in the higher regions of the material sky, and what to speak of those planets situated in the anti-material sky, which is far beyond the material universe. Even the yogis who have perfectly controlled mystic powers have great difficulty entering into that region. Master yogi, yogis who, can, who control the anti-material particle within the material body by practice of mystic powers can give up their material bodies at will at a certain opportune moment and can thus enter the anti-material worlds through a specific thoroughfare which connects the material and anti-material worlds. If they are at all able, they act in accordance with the prescribed method given in the Bhagavad Gita. Those who have realized the transcendence can reach the anti-material world by leaving their material bodies during the period of Uttarayama, which that is, when the sun is on its northern path or during auspicious moments in which the deities of fire and effulgence control the atmosphere. The different deities or powerful directing officers are appointed to act in the administration of cosmic activities. Foolish people who are unable to see the intricacies of cosmic management laugh at the idea of personal management of fire, electricity, air, days, nights, etc. by demigods. 
but the perfect yogis know how to satisfy these unseen administrators of material affairs and taking advantage of the goodwill of these administrators, leave their material bodies at, dirt, at will during opportune moments, moments arranged for entrance into the anti-material universe or into the highest planets of the material sky. In the higher planets of the material world, the yogis can enjoy more comfortable and more pleasant lives for hundreds and thousands of years, but life in those higher planets is not eternal. Those who desire eternal life enter into the anti-material universe through mystic powers at op certain opportune moments created by the administ demigod administrators of cosmic affairs, administrators unseen by the gross materialists who reside on this seventh class planet called, quote, Earth, end quote. Those who are not yogis, but who die at an opportune moment due to pious acts of sacrifice, charity, penance, etc., can rise to the higher planets after death, but are subject to return to this planet, Earth. Their going forth takes place at a period known as Duma, or the dark, moonless half of the month, where the sun is on its southern path. In summary, the Bhagavad Gita recommends that one adopt the means of devotional service or anti-material activities if one wishes to enter the anti-material world. Those who adopt the means of devotional service as prescribed by the expert transcendentalist are never disappointed in their attempts to enter the anti-material world. Although the obstacles are many, the devotees of Lord Krishna can easily overcome them by rigidly following the path outlined by the transcendental devotees. Such devotees who are passengers progressing in the journey of life toward the anti-material kingdom of God, are never bewildered. No one is cheated or disappointed when he adopts the guaranteed path of devotion for entrance into the anti-material universe. One can easily attain all the results that are derived from the study of the studies of the Vedas, performance of sacrifice, practices of penance and offerings of charities, simply by the unilateral performance of devotional service, technically known as bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga is, therefore, the great panacea for all, and it has been made easy to practice, especially in this Iron Age, by Lord Krishna himself in his most sublime, liberal, and munificent appearance as Lord Sri Chaitanya, 1486 to 1534, who appeared in Bengal to spread the Sankirtan movement, singing, dancing, and chanting the names of God throughout India. By Lord Chaitanya's grace, one can quickly pick up the principles of Bhakti Yoga. Thus, all misgivings in the heart will disappear, and the fire of material tribulation will be extinguished, and transcendental bliss will be ushered in. In the fifth chapter of the Brahma Samhita, there is a description of the variegated planetary system that is within the material world. It is also indicated in the Bhagavad Gita that there are variegated planetary systems in hundreds of thousands of material universes, and that altogether these universes comprise only a fraction, one-fourth, of the creative energy of the Godhead. The majority, three-fourths, of the Lord's creative energy is manifested in the spiritual sky, called the Paravyoma, or the Vaikuntha Loka. These instructions from, of the Brahma Samhita and Bhagavad Gita must be, may be finally confirmed by the material scientist as he researches into the existence of the anti-material world. In addition, a February 21, 1960 Moscow news release reported, Russia's well-known professor of astronomy, Boris Voronstov, Vilay Minov said that there must be an infinite number of planets in the universe inhabited by beings endowed with reason. This statement by the Russian astronomer is a confirmation of the information given in the Brahma Samhita, which states, Yasya Prabha Parvavato Jagadananda Koti, Koti Shravashesha Vasudati Vibhuti Binam, Tad Brahma Nishkalamananta Shesha Bhutam, Govinda Madhi Purusham Tamham Jami. According to this quote from the Brahma Samhita, there are not only an infinite number of planets, as confirmed by the Russian astronomer, but there are also infinite number of universes. All these infinite universes with their infinite planets within are floating on and are produced from the Brahman effulgence emanating from the transcendental body of Mahavishnu, 
who is worshipped by Brahma, the presiding deity of the universe in which we are residing. The Russian astronomer also confirms that all the planets, which are estimated to be not less than 100 million, are inhabited. In the Brahma Samhita, there is indication that in each and every one of the infinite number of universes, there are infinite numbers of variegated planets. The astronomer's view was seconded by Professor Vladimir Altoptov, a biologist who maintained that some of the above-mentioned planets had reached the state of development corresponding to that of the Earth. The report from Moscow continued, it could be that life, similar to that on Earth, flourishes on such planets. Doctor of Chemistry Nikolai Zirov, covering the problem of atmosphere on the planets, pointed out that the organism of a Martian, for instance, could very well adapt itself to normal existence with a low body temperature. He said that he felt that, that the gaseous composition of the atmosphere of Mars was quite suitable to sustain life of beings which have become adopted to it. The adaptability of organisms in different varieties of planets is described in the Brahma Samhita as vibhuti binam, i.e. each and every one of the innumerable planets within the universe is endowed with a particular type of atmosphere and the living beings there are advanced in science, psychology, etc. according to the superiority or inferiority of the atmosphere. Vibhuti means, quote, specific power and binam means, quote, variegated, end quote. Scientists who are attempting to explore outer space in an attempt to reach other planets by mechanical means must realize that organisms adapted to the atmosphere of Earth cannot exist in the atmospheres of other planets. As such, man's attempts to reach the Moon, the Sun, or Mars will be completely futile because of the different atmospheres prevailing on those planets. Individually, however, one can attempt to go to any planet he desires, but this is only possible by psychological changes in the mind. Mind is the nucleus of the material body. The gradual evolutionary progress of the material body depends on psychological changes within the mind. The change of the bodily construction of a worm into that of a butterfly in modern medical science, the conversion of a man's body into that of a woman or vice versa, are more or less dependent on psychological changes. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is said that if a man at the time of death concentrates his mind on the, upon the form of the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, and while so doing relinquishes his body, he at once enters into the spiritual existence of the anti-material world. This means that anyone who trains the mind to turn from matter to the spiritual form of the Godhead by performance of the prescribed rules of devotional service can easily attain the kingdom of God in the anti-material sky and of this there is no doubt. And in the same way, if one desires to enter any other planet of the material sky, he can go there just after quitting the present body, i.e. after death. Thus, if someone wants to go to the moon, the sun, or Mars, he can do so simply by performing acts for that purpose. The Bhagavad Gita confirms this statement in the following words. That upon which a person meditates at the time of death, quitting his body fully absorbed in thoughts thereof, that particular thing he attains after death. Maharaj Bharat, despite a life of severe penances, thought of a stag at the time of his death and thus became a stag after death. However, he did retain clear consciousness of his past life and realized his mistake. It is important to realize that one's thoughts at the time of death are influenced by the actual deeds which one performs during this during his life. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, 3rd Canto, Chapter 32, the process of entering the moon as described as follows. Materialistic-minded men who have no information of the kingdom of God are always mad after material acquisition of wealth, fame, and adoration. Such men are interested in the progressive wheel of their particular family unit for their own self-satisfaction and, and so are also interested in the progress of social and national welfare. These men attain their desired objects by material activities. They are mechanically engaged in the ritualistic discharge of prescribed duties and are consequently satis inclined to satisfy the pitas or bygone forefathers and controlling demigods by performance of sacrifices as prescribed in the revealed scriptures. Addicted to such acts of sacrifices and ceremonial observances, such souls enter into the moon after death. 
When one is thus promoted to the moon, he receives the capacity to enjoy the, the drinking of somaras, a celestial beverage. The moon is a place where the demigod Chandra is the predominating deity. The atmosphere and amenities of life there are far more comfortable and advantageous to those here on earth. After reaching the moon, if a soul does not utilize the opportunity for promotion to better planets, he is degraded and forced to return to earth or a similar planet. However, materialistic persons, although they may attain the topmost planetary system, are certainly annihilated at the time of the cosmic manifestation's dissolution. As far as the planetary system of the spiritual sky is concerned, there are unlimited Vaikuta planets in the Paravyoma. The Vaikuntas are spiritual planets which are manifestations of the internal potency of the Lord, and the ratio of these planets of the material to the material planets, external energy in the material sky, is three to one. So, the poor materialist is busy making political adjustments on a planet which is most insignificant in God's creation. To say nothing of this planet, Earth, the whole universe with innumerable planets throughout the galaxies, is comparable to a grain of mustard seed in a bag of full of mustard seeds. But the poor materialist makes plans to live comfortably here and thus wastes his valuable human energy in something which is doomed to frustration. Instead of wasting his time with business speculations, he might have sought the life of plain living and high spiritual thinking and thus saved himself from perpetual materialistic unrest. Even if a materialist wants to enjoy developed material facilities, he can transfer himself to planets where he can experience material pleasures much more advanced than those available on the planet Earth. But the best plan is to prepare oneself to return to the spiritual sky after leaving the body. However, if one is intent on enjoying material activities, one can transfer himself to other planets in the material sky by utilizing yogic powers. The playful spaceships of the astronauts are but childish entertainments and are of no use for this purpose. The Ashtanga yoga system is also materialistic in as much as it teaches one to control the movements of air within the material body. The spiritual spark, the soul, is floating on air within the body, and annihilation and exhalation, or inhalation and exhalation are the ways of that air containing the soul. Therefore, the yoga system is a materialistic art of controlling this air by transferring it from the stomach to the navel, from the chest to the collarbone, and there to the eyeballs, and from there to the cere cere cerebellum, and from there to any desired planet. The velocities of air and light are taken into consideration by the material science scientists, but he has no information of the velocity of the mind and intelligence. We have some limited experience of the velocity of the mind because in a moment we can transfer our minds to places hundreds of thousands of miles away. Intelligence is even finer. Finer than intelligence is the soul, which is not matter like mind and intelligence, but is spirit or antimatter. The soul is hundreds of thousands of times finer and more powerful than intelligence. We can thus only imagine the velocity of the soul and its traveling from one planet to another. Needless to say, the soul travels by its own strength and, with, and not with the help of any kind of material vehicle. The bestial civilization of eating, sleeping, fearing, and sense gratifying has misled modern man into forgetting how powerful a soul he has. As we have already described, the soul is a spiritual spark which is many, many times more illuminating, dazzling, and powerful than the sun, moon, or electricity. Human life is spoiled when man does not realize his real identity with his soul. Lord Chaitanya appeared with his disciple Nityananda to save man from this kind of type of misleading civilization. Srimad Bhagavatam also describes how yogis can travel to all the planets in the universe. When the vital force is lifted to the cerebellum, there is every chance that of this force bursting out from the eyes, nose, ears, etc., as these are places which are known as the seventh orbit of the vital force. But the yogis can block out these holes by the complete suspension of air. The yogi then concentrates the vital force in the middle position, that is, between the eyebrows. At this position, the yogi can think of the planet into which he wants to enter after leaving the body. 
he can then decide whether he wants to go to the abode of Krishna in the transcendental Vaikuntas from which he will not be required to descend in the, into this material world or to travel to higher planets in the material universe. The perfect yogi is at liberty to do either. For the perfect yogi who has attained success in the method of leaving his body in perfect consciousness, transferring from one planet to another is as easy as an ordinary man's walking to the grocery store. As already discussed, the material body is just a covering of the spiritual soul. Mind and intelligence are undercoverings, and the gross body of earth, water, air, etc. is the undercoating of the soul. As such, any advanced soul who has realized himself by the yogic process, who knows the relationship between matter and spirit, can leave the gross dress of the soul in perfect order as he desire, and as he desires. By the grace of God, we have complete freedom. Because God is kind to us, we can live anywhere, either in the spiritual sky or in the material sky, upon whichever planet we desire. However, misuse of this freedom causes one to fall down into the material world and suffer the threefold miseries of conditioned life. The living of a miserable life in the material world by dint of the soul's choice is nicely illustrated by Milton in Paradise Lost. Similarly, the choice the soul can regain, by choice, the soul can regain paradise and return home back to Godhead. At the critical time of death, one can place the vital force between the two eyebrows and decide wherever he wants to go. If he is reluctant to maintain any connection with the material world, he can, in less than a second, reach the transcendental Vaikuntha and appear there completely in his spiritual body, which is, will be suitable for him in the spiritual atmosphere. He has simply the desire to leave the material world in both finer and grosser forms and then move the vital force to the topmost part of the skull and leave the body from the hole in the skull called the Brahmarandra. This is the highest perfection of the practice of yoga. Of course, man is endowed with free will, and as such, he does not want to free him. If he does not want to free himself of the material world, he may enjoy the life of Brahmapad, occupation of the post of Brahma, and visit Siddhaloka, the planets of materially perfect beings who have full abilities to control gravity, space, time, etc. To visit these higher planets in the material universe, one need not give up his mind and intelligence, finer matter but need only give up the grosser matter, the material body. Man-made satellites and material or mechanistic space vehicles will never be able to carry human beings to the planets of outer space. Men cannot even go on their m much advertised trips to the moon, for as far as, as we have already stated, the atmosphere on such higher planets have, are different, is different from the atmosphere here on Earth. Each and every planet has its particular atmosphere, and if one wants to travel to any particular planet within the material universe, one has to have a material body exactly adapted to the climactic condition of that planet. For instance, if one wants to go from India to Europe, where the climactic condition is different, one has to change his dress accordingly. Similarly, a complete change of body is necessary if one wants to go to the transcendental planets of Vaikuntha. If one wants to go to the higher, higher material planets, he can keep his finer dress of mind, intelligence, and ego, but he has to leave his gross dress, body, made of earth, water, fire, etc. When one goes to, the, to a transcendental planet, however, it is necessary to change both the finer and gross bodies, for one has to reach the spiritual sky completely in a spiritual form. This change of dress will take place automatically at the time of death if one so desires. But this desire is possible at death only if the desire is cultivated during life. Where one's treasures are, there is also one's heart. When one practices devotional service, one cultivates a desire for the kingdom of God. The following details outlines a general practice by which one can prepare himself for an easy journey to Vaikuntha, anti-material planets where life is free from birth, old age, disease, and death. General practice, positive functions. Number one, the serious candidate must accept a bona fide spiritual master in order to be trained scientifically. Because the senses are material, it is not at all possible to realize the transcendence by them. Therefore, the senses have to be spiritualized by the prescribed method under the direction of the spiritual master. 
Number two, when the student has chosen a bona fide spiritual master, he must take the proper initiation from him. This marks the beginning of spiritual training. Number three, the candidate must prepare, be prepared to satisfy the spiritual master in every way. A bona fide spiritual master who is fully cognizant of the methods of spiritual science learned in the spiritual scripture, uh, scriptures such as Bhagavad Gita, Vedanta, Srimad Bhagavatam, and Upanishads, and who is also a realized soul who has made a tangible connection with the Supreme Lord, is the transparent medium by which the willing candidate is led to the path of the Vaikuntas. The spiritual master must be satisfied in all respects because simply by his good wishes, a candidate can make wonderful progress along the path. Number four, the intelligent candidate places intelligent questions to the spiritual master in order to clear his path of all uncertainties. The spiritual master shows the way, not whimsically, but in accordance with the principles of the authorities who have actually traversed the path. The names of these authorities are disclosed in the scriptures, and one has to simply follow them under the direction of the spiritual master. The spiritual master never deviates from the path of the authorities. Number five, the candidate should always try to follow in the footsteps of the great sages who have practiced the method and attained success. This should be taken as a motto in life. One should not superficially imitate them, but should follow them sincerely in terms of the particular time and circumstances. Number six, a candidate must be prepared to change his habits in terms of the direct instructions contained in the books of authority. For the satisfaction of the Lord, he must be prepared to sacrifice both sense gratification and sense abdignation, following the example of Arjuna. Number seven, the candidate should live in a spiritual atmosphere. Number eight, he should be satisfied with as much wealth as sufficient for maintenance only. He should not try to amass more wealth than is necessary to sustain himself in a simple way. Number nine, he must observe fasting gates such as the 11th day of the growing and waning moon. Number 10, he must show respect to the banyan tree, the cow, the learned brahmana, and the devotee. These are the first stepping stones toward the path of, spirit, of devotional service. Gradually, one has to adopt other items which are negative in character. Number 11. One should avoid offenses in the discharge of devotional service in chanting the holy names. Number 12. He should avoid extensive association with non-devotees. Number 13. He must not take on unlimited disciples. This means that a candidate who is successfully followed the first 12 items, can also become a spiritual master himself, just as a student becomes a monitor in class with a limited number of disciples. Number 14, he must not pose himself as a vastly learned man simply by quoting statements in books. He must have solid knowledge of the necessary books without superfluous knowledge of in others. Number 15, a regular and successful practice of the above 14 items will enable the candidate to maintain mental equilibrium even amidst great trials of material loss and gain. Number 16. In this next stage, the candidate does not become afflicted by lamentation and illusion. Number 17. He does not deride another's mode of religion or worship, nor does he deride the personality of Godhead or his devotees. Number 18. He never tolerates blasphemy against the Lord or his devotees. Number 19, he should not indulge in the discussion of topics dealing with the relationship between men and women, nor should he engage in useless topics concerning others' family affairs. Number 20, he should not inflict pain, either in body or in mind, upon other living beings, whomsoever they may be. Out of the above 20 items, the first three positive items are imperative and most essential for the serious candidate. There are four 44 other items to be followed by the serious candidate, but Lord Chaitanya has selected five as the most important. These were selected owing to the present conditions of civic life. They are as follows. Number one, one should associate with the devotees. Association with devotees is made possible by hearing them attentively, asking them relevant questions, and by supplying them food, and by accepting food from them, and by giving them charity, and by accepting from them whatever they offer. Number two, one should chant the holy name of the Lord in all circumstances. This chanting of the Lord's name is an easy and inexpensive process of realization. One can chant any of the innumerable names of the Lord at any time. 
one should try to avoid offenses. There are 10 offenses which one can commit while chanting the transcendental names, and these should be avoided as far as possible. But in any event, one should try to chant the holy name of the Lord at all times. Number three, one should hear the transcendental topics enunciated in the Srimad Bhagavatam. This hearing is made possible through platform lectures by bona fide devotees and by authorized translations of the Bhagavatam. Number four, one should make his home at Mathura, the birthplace of Lord Krishna, or one should make his home as good as Mathura by installing a deity of the Lord to be worshipped by all members of the family after proper initiation from the spiritual master. Number five, one should worship the installed deity with retention and devotion so that the whole atmosphere of one's home becomes the replica of the Lord's abode. This is made possible by the direction of the spiritual master who knows the transcendental art and can show the candidate the proper method. The above five items can be adopted by any man in any part of the world. Thus, anyone can prepare himself for returning home back to Godhead by the simple method recognized by authorities such as Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who specifically invented himself to deliver the fallen souls of this age. For further details on this subject, one should read literatures like Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, of which we have presented an English summary study entitled The Nectar of Devotion. The whole process of transferring oneself to the spiritual sky involves gradually liquidating the material composition of the gross and subtle coverings of the spirit soul. The above mentioned five items of devotional service are so spiritually powerful that their performance by a devotee, even in the preliminary stage, can very quickly promote the sincere executor to the stage of bhava, the stage just prior to love of Godhead, or emotion on the spiritual plane which is transcendental to men mental and intellectual functions. In complete absorption in bhava, or love of God, one makes one fit to be transferred to the spiritual sky just after leaving the material tabernacle. The perfection of love of God by a devotee actually situates him on the spiritual platform even though he may still maintain a gross material body. He becomes like a red-hot iron which, when in contact with fire, actually ceases to be iron and acts as fire. These things are made possible by the Lord's inscrutable and inconceivable energy, which material science has not the scope to calculate. One should therefore engage himself in devotional service with absolute faith and make his faith steadfast. One should seek the association of the standard devotees of the Lord by personal association, if possible, or by thinking of them. This association will help one develop factual devotional service to the Lord, which will cause any material misgivings to disappear like a flash of lightning. All these different stages of spiritual realization will be personally felt by the candidate, and this will create in him a firm belief that he is making positive progress on the way to the spiritual sky. And then he will become sincerely attached to the Lord and his abode. Such is the gradual progress process of evolving love of God, which is the prime necessity for the human form of life. There are instances in history of great personalities, including sages and kings, who obtained perfection by this process. Some of them attained success even by adhering to one single item of devotional service with faith and perseverance. Some of these personalities are listed below. Number one, Emperor Prickett attain spiritual, the spiritual platform simply by hearing from such an authority as Sri Shukadev Goswami. Number two, Sri Shukadev Goswami attained the same simply by recitation verbatim of the transcendental message which he received from his great father, Sri Vyasadev. Number three, Emperor Prahlad attained spiritual success by remembering the Lord constantly in pursuance of instructions given by Sri Narada Muni, the great saint and devotee. Number four, Lakshmiji, the goddess of fortune, attained success simply by sitting and serving the lotus feet of the Lord. Number five, King Pritu attained success simply by worshiping the Lord. Six, Akura, the charioteer, accepted success simply by chanting prayers for the Lord. Seven, Hanuman, 
Mahavirya, the famous non-human -devo devotee that Lord Shri Ram, of Lord Sri Ramchandra, attained success simply by carrying out the orders of the Lord. Number eight, Arjuna, the great warrior, attained the same perfection simply by making friends with the Lord, who delivered the message of Bhagavad Gita to enlighten Arjuna and his followers. And number nine, Emperor Bali attained success by surrendering everything to the Lord, including his personal body. These are nine standard modes of devotional service to the Lord, and a candidate can choose to adopt any one, two, three, four, or all, however he likes. All the services rendered to the absolute are in themselves absolute, with none of the qualitative or quantitative differences found on the material platform. On the spiritual platform, everything is identical and ev with everything else, although there is transcendental variegatedness. Emperor Amparish adopted all the above five or nine items, and he attained perfect success. It was he who engaged his mind on the lotus feet of the Lord, his voice in describing the spiritual world, his hands in cleansing the temple of the Lord, his ears in submissively hearing the words of Lord Sri Krishna, his eyes in viewing the deity of the Lord, his body in touching the bodies of devotees, his nostrils in smelling the flowers offered to the Lord, his tongue in tasting the food offered to the Lord, his legs in visiting the temple of the Lord, and all his the energy of his life in executing the services of the Lord without in the least desiring his own sense gratification. All these activities helped him attain the perfect stage of life which defeats all dexterities of material science. It is therefore important for all human beings to adopt these principles of spiritual realization for the perfection of life. A human being's only obligation is spiritual realization. Unfortunately, in modern civilization, human society is too busy in discharging national duties. Actually, national duties, social duties, and humanitarian duties are obligatory only to those who are bereft of spiritual duties. As soon as a man takes his birth on this earth, not only does he have national, social, and humanitarian obligations, but he also has obligations to the demigods who supply air, light, water, etc. He also has obligations to the great sages who have left behind them vast treasure houses of knowledge to guide him through life. He has obligations to all kinds of living beings, to his forefathers, family members, and so forth and so on. But as soon as one engages himself in the one single obligatory duty, the duty of spiritual perfection, he automatically liquidates all other obligations without having to make separate efforts. A devotee of the Lord is never a disturbing element in society. On the contrary, he is a great social asset. No, since no sincere devotee is attracted to sinful actions, as soon as a man becomes a pure devotee, he can do inestimable selfless service to society for the peace and prosperity of all concerned in this life and in the next. But even if it, such a devotee commits some offense, the Lord himself rectifies it in no time. Therefore, there is no need for a devotee to cultivate materialistic knowledge, nor does a devotee need to renounce everything and live as a hermit. He can simply remain at home and execute devotional service smoothly in any order of life. And there are many instances in history of extremely cruel men becoming kind-hearted simply by the execution of devotional service. Knowledge and abnegation of an inferior way of life will automatically follow in the life of a pure devotee without his having to make extraneous effort. This spiritual art and science of devotional service is the highest contribution by, of Indian sages to the rest of the world. Therefore, everyone who has taken his birth in India has an obligation to perfect his life by adopting the principles of this great art and science and distributing it to the rest of the world, which is still ignorant of the ultimate goal of life. Human society is destined to reach this stage of perfection by gradual development of knowledge. Indian sages, however, have already reached that position. Why do others have to wait for thousands and thousands of years to attain their heights? Why not give them in the information immediately in a systematic way so that they may save time and energy? They should take advantage of a life for which they have labored millions of years to attain. A Russian fiction writer is now contributing suggestions to the rest of the world that scientific progress can may help man to live forever. 
Of course, he does not believe in a supreme being who is the creator. Yet, we welcome his suggestion because we know that actual progress in scientific knowledge will certainly take men to the spiritual sky and inform the scientists that there is a supreme creator who has full potencies beyond all materialistic scientific conceptions. As mentioned, every living being is eternal in form, but he has to change his outer coverings, gross and subtle, and this changing process is technically known as life and death. As long as the living being has to put on the shackles of materialist bondage, there is no relief from this changing process which continues even in the highest stage of material life. The Russian fiction writer may speculate, as fiction writers are apt to do, but saner people with some knowledge of natural law will not agree that man can live forever within this material world. The naturalist can see the general course of material nature simply by studying a piece of fruit. A small fruit develops from a flower, stays, grows for some time on the branch, becomes full grown, ripens, and then begins to dwindle daily until it finally falls from the tree and commences to decompose into the earth and at last mingles with the earth, leaving behind its seed, which in turn grows to become a tree which produces many fruits in time, which all will meet the same fate, and so on and so on. Similarly, a living being, so as a spiritual spark, a part of the supreme being, takes its organic form in the womb of a mother just after sexual intercourse. It grows little by little within the womb, is born, then continues growing, becoming a child, youth, boy, youth, adult, old man, and finally dwindles and meets death despite all the good wishes and hopeful pipe dreams of fiction writers. By comparison, there is no difference between the man and the fruit. Like the fruit, the man may leave behind him his seeds of numerous children, but he cannot exist eternally within his material body due to the law of material nature. How can anyone ignore the law of material nature? No material scientist can change the stringent laws of nature, however boastful he may be. No astronomer or scientist can change the course of the planets. He can only manufacture a paltry toy planet, which he calls a satellite. Foolish children may be impressed by this and may give a great deal of credit to the inventors of modern scientists, or satellites, Sputniks, etc., but the saner section of humanity gives more credit to the creator of the gigantic satellites, namely the sun, stars, and planets, of which the material scientists can see no end. If a small toy satellite has a creator in Russia or America, it is reasonable that the gigantic scientists or satellites have their creator in the spiritual sky. If, the toy, if a toy satellite requires so many scientific brains for its manufacture and its orbiting, what kind of subtle and perfect brain created galaxies of stars and maintains them in their orbits? Thus far, the atheistic class of men have not been able to answer this. Non-believers put forward their own theories of the creation, which usually result in statements such as, quote, it's hard to understand, end quote, Quote, our imagination cannot conceive it, but it's quite possible, end quote. Quote, it's incomprehensible, end quote, and so forth. This only means that their information has no authoritative basis and is not backed by scientific data. They simply speculate. However, authorized information is available in the Bhagavad Gita. For instance, in Bhagavad Gita, informs us that within the material world there are living beings whose duration of life covers 4,300,000 times 1,000 times 2 times 30 times 12 times 100 solar years. We accept the Bhagavad Gita as authority because this book of knowledge was so accepted by India's great sages like Shankaracharya, Sri Mamanujacharya, Sri Madhvacharya, and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The Bhagavad Gita indicates that in the material world, all competent forms or component forms are subject to decay and death, regardless of their duration of life. Therefore, all material shapes are subject to the law of change, although potentially the material energy is conserved. Potentially, everything is eternal, but in the material world, matter takes shape, remains for some time, develops into maturity, becomes old, begins to dwindle, and at last disappears again. This is the case with all material objects. 
the materialist suggestion that beyond the material sky there is, quote, some other form, end quote, which is beyond the boundary of visibility and which is strange and inconceivable, is but a faint indication of the spiritual sky. However, the basic principle of spirit is much closer for it functions within all living beings. When that spiritual principle is out of the material body, then the material body has no life. Within the body of a child, for instance, the spiritual principle is present and therefore changes take place in the body and it develops. But if the spirit leaves the body, the development stops. This law is applicable to every material object. Matter transforms from one shape to another when it has in contact with spirit. Without spirit, there is no transformation. The entire universe develops in that way. It emanates from the energy of the transcendence because of the spiritual force which is his, and it develops into gigantic forms like the sun, moon, earth, etc. There are 14 divisions of planetary systems, and although they are all different in dimension and quality, the same principle of development holds true for all. The spiritual force is the creator, and by this spiritual principle only, transformation, transition, and development take place. Life is definitely not generated simply by a material reaction like a chemical combination, as many foolish men claim. Material interaction is set in motion by a superior being who creates a favorable circumstance to accommodate the spiritual living force. The superior energy handles matter in an appropriate way as determined by the free will of the spiritual being. For example, building materials do not automatically, quote, react, end quote, and suddenly assume the shape of a residential house. The living spiritual being handles matter appropriately by his free will and thus constructs his house. Matt, simple, similarly, matter is the ingredient only, but the spirit is the creator. Only a man with a poor fund of knowledge avoids this conclusion. The creator must re, the creator may remain unseen in the background, but that does not mean that there is no creator. If one should not be illusioned simply by the gigantic form of the material universe. One should rather learn to discern the existence of supreme intelligence behind all these material manifestations. The supreme being who is the supreme intelligence is the ultimate creator, the all-attractive per supreme personality of Godhead, Shri Krishna. Although one may not be aware of this, there is definite information of the creator given in Vedic literatures such as the Bhagavad Gita and especially the Srimad Bhagavatam. When a satellite is thrown into outer space, a child may not understand that there are scientific brains behind it, but an intelligent adult realizes that scientific brains on Earth are controlling the satellite. Similarly, less intelligent persons do not have information of the Creator and His eternal abode in the spiritual sky, which is far beyond our range of visibility, but in actuality there is a spiritual sky and spiritual planets which are more spacious and greater in number than planets in the material sky. From the Bhagavad Gita we receive information that the material universe only constitutes a fraction, one-fourth of the creation. Such information is extensively available in the Srimad Bhagavatam and in other Vedic literatures. If living energy can be created in the scientist's laboratory by, quote, the interaction of certain physical and chemical combinations, end quote, then why haven't the boastful material scientists been able to manufacture life? They should know definitely that spiritual force is distinct from matter and that such energy is not possible to produce by any amount of material adjustment. At present, Russians and Americans are undoubtedly very much advanced in many departments of technological science, but they are still ignorant of the spiritual science. They will have to learn from superior intelligence in order to make a perfect and progressive human society. The Russians are unaware that in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the socialist philosophy is most perfectly described. The Bhagavatam instructs that whatever wealth exists, all natural resources, agriculture, mining, etc., is created by the ultimate creator, and therefore every living being has a right to take part of them. It is further said that man, a man should only possess as much wealth as is sufficient to maintain his body, and that if he desires more than that, or if he takes more than his share, he is subject to punishment. It is also stated that animals should be treated as one's own children. We believe that no nation on earth can describe socialism as well as the Srimad Bhagavatam. 
Living beings other than humans can be treated as brothers and children only when one has a full conception of the Creator and the actual contribution of the living being. Man's desire to be deathless is realized only in the spiritual world, as stated in the beginning of this essay. A desire for eternal life is a sign of dormant spiritual life. The aim of human civilization should be targeted to that end. It is possible for every human being to transfer himself to that spiritual realm by the process of bhakti yoga as described herein. It is a great science, and India has produced many scientific literatures by which the perfection of life may be realized. Bhakti yoga is the eternal religion of man. At a time when material science predominates all subjects, including the tenets of religion, it would be enlivening to see the principles of the eternal religion of man from the viewpoint of the modern scientists. Even Dr. S. Ramakrishnan admitted that at a world religion conference that religion will not be accepted in modern civilization if it is not accepted from a scientific point of view. In reply, we are glad to announce to the lovers of the truth that bhakti yoga is the eternal religion of the world and is intended for all living beings who are all eternally related to the Supreme Lord. Sripad Ramanujacharya redefines the word sanatan or, quote, eternal, end quote, as that which has neither beginning nor end. When we speak of Sanatan Dharma, eternal religion, we take this definition for granted. That which has neither beginning nor end is unlike anything sectarian, which has limits or ba and boundaries. In the light of modern science, it will be possible for us to see Sanatan Dharma as the main occupation of all people of the world, nay, of all living entities of the universe. Non Sanatan religious faith may have some beginning in the annals of man, but there is no historic origin of Sanatan Dharma because it eternally remains with the living entities. When a man professes to belong to a particular faith, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, or any other sect, and when he refers to a particular time and circumstance of birth, such designations are called non Sanatan Dharma. A Hindu may become a Muslim, or a Muslim may become a Hindu or Christian, etc., but in all circumstances there is one constant. In all circumstances he is rendering service to others. A Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, or Christian is in all circumstances a servant of someone. The particular type of faith professed is not Sanatan Dharma. Sanatan Dharma is the constant companion of the living being, the unifier of all religions. Sanatan Dharma is the rendering of service. In the Bhagavad Gita, there are several references to that which is Sanatan. Let us learn the import of Sanatan Dharma from this authority. There is reference to the word Sanatan in the 10th verse of the 7th chapter, in which the Lord says that he is the eternal fountainhead of everything and is therefore Sanatan. The fountainhead of everything is described in the Upanishads as the complete whole. All emanations of the fountainhead are also complete in themselves, but although many complete units emanate from the complete Sanatan fountainhead, the Sanatan head does not diminish in quality or quantity. That is because the nature of Sanatan is not changeable. Anything that changes under the influence of time and circumstances is not Sanatan. Anything, therefore, that changes whatsoever in form or quality cannot be accepted as Sanatan. To give a material example, the sun has been dis disseminating its rays for hundreds of millions of years, and yet although it is a materially created object, its form and rays are still unchanged. Therefore, that which is never created cannot change its formation and quality, even though he is the seedling source of everything. The Lord claims to be the father of all species of life. He claims that all living entity, entities, regardless of what they are, are part and parcel of him. Consequently, the Bhagavad Gita is meant for all of them. In the Bhagavad Gita, there is information of this Sanatan nature of the Supreme Lord. There is also information about of his abode, which is far beyond the material sky, and of the sanatan nature of the living beings. Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita also informs us that this material world is full of miseries in the shape of birth, old age, disease, and death. Even in the topmost planet of the material universe, Brahmaloka, these miseries are present. Only in his own abode is there a total absence of misery. In that abode, there is no need of light for from sun, moon, or fire. 
The planets are self-luminous. Life there is perpetual and full of knowledge and bliss, that which is known as Sanatana Dharma. It is therefore natural to conclude that the living entities must return home back to Godhead to enjoy life in the Sanatan Dharma with the Sanatan Purusha or the Purushottama, Lord Sri Krishna. They must not remain to rot in this miserable land of material existence. There is no happiness in the material sphere, even in Brahma Loka, so plans and activities for elevation to higher planets within the material universe are carried out by those who are less intelligent. Less intelligent men also take shelter of demigods and only derive benefits which endure for a limited period. Thus, their religious principles and the benefits derived therefrom are only temporary. The intelligent man, however, abandons all engagements in the name of religion and takes shelter of the supreme personality of Godhead and thus receives absolute perfection, protection from the Almighty Father. Sanatan Dharma is therefore the process of Bhakti Yoga by which one can come to know the Sanatan Lord and his Sanatan abode. By this process, one can return to the spiritual universe, the Sanatan Dharma, to take part in the Sanatan enjoyment prevailing there. Those who are followers of Sanatan Dharma may henceforward take up those principles in the spirit of the Bhagavad Gita. There is nothing barring anyone from adopting the eternal principles. Even persons who are less enlightened can return to Godhead. This is the version taught by Srimad Bhagavatam and by the Supreme Lord himself in the Bhagavad Gita. Mankind should be given a chance to take advantage of this opportunity. Because Bhagavad Gita was spoken in the land of Bhart Varsh, every Indian has the responsibility to broadcast the message of real Sanatan Dharma in other parts of the world. Especially at the present moment, misguided men are suffering in the darkness of materialism, and their so-called learning has enabled them to discover the atomic bomb. They are consequently on the verge of annihilation. Sanatan Dharma, however, will teach them about the real purpose of life, and they will benefit by its propagation. <laughs>